What's the biggest fear of the creative mind? Sure, every mind, creative chiefly, are unique and liquid, yet... I'd hedge my bets that the most prevalent threat of anxiety is the dread that one day, the creativity will dry up. And all the thoughts that inhabited that fertile delta will surely rot away. It's a fear that branches in every direction, as paranoia roots deeper and deeper. You fear your audience will evaporate and you'll have no one to create for. You fear perhaps you never had any true talent to begin with, and you're only masquerading about, tricking everybody who believed in you, and, even more disconcertingly, you fooled yourself into thinking you had merit to give. You then fear people who admire your work will catch on to your madness and delusions. Quickly, thoughts begin to compound upon one another until suspicion is too heavy to lift to reach the ideas that are foregone. You spiral through your psychosis until your world's removed from creativity. Simple writer's block leaves your mind catatonic and completely lost. How the hell does one come back from such an ordeal? Why don't we look to Fellini's 1963 masterpiece, Eight and a Half, for a beacon? Fellini said of the film, In the case of Eight and a Half, something happened to me which I'd feared could happen, but when it did, it was more terrible than I could have ever imagined. I suffered director's block, like writer's block. I had a producer, a contract. I was at Sanchita, and everybody was ready and waiting for me to make a film. What they didn't know was that the film I was going to make had fled from me. The sets were already up, but I couldn't find my sentimental feeling. The story of Eight and a Half follows Guido, a translucent stand-in for Fellini, a famous director who's set to film a big-budget science fiction film, but he's nowhere close to being ready, despite filming starting in weeks. He retreats to a luxury spa to collect his thoughts, yet his troubles continue to increase as the production moves to him to force him to work on the picture. Escaping his failing marriage, he's accompanied by his dense, long-term mistress, whose only topic of conversation seems to be her husband. He's plagued with poor health, only to be prescribed holy water as a cure. Everywhere he goes, he's shadowed by fans, critics, crew members, and other sycophants, demanding meaning and answers. All the while, he realizes he's lost his real friends due to his fame and devotion to his craft. He's taken from this world often by fantasies and memories corrupted by time, though the refuge of his dreams allows no reprieve from the torment of his existence. He dreams of his deceased father and mother as they show nothing but disappointment in what he perceives as his failures. He remembers his upbringing through the Catholic Church and the arrested development it caused him, especially during the scene of his sexual awakening as a young boy, burying him under guilt and shame. The only positive delusion that reoccurs is that of the woman in white, though even he sees the absurdity in her purity. He invites his wife to the production in an attempt to reassure her, but quickly she spots his mistress at the hotel and resigns herself to defeat. As they begin casting parts in the movie, she realizes the movie is merely his attempt to make sense of his life. Casting thinly veiled caricatures of her, his mistress, and others, she leaves him. Eventually, he is drugged to set against his will to give a press conference in front of a massive rocket ship set that's already been built for filming. Guido is bombarded with questions and accusations, juxtaposed against imaginary indictments from other characters. He crawls under the table and promptly shoots himself in the head. The scene cuts to Guido and his financier walking to a car, as the crew begins to dismantle the giant set behind them. The financier tells Guido that he made the right decision to cancel the production. It's better for him to be clear about his vision than go on blindly. He then has an epiphany as clowns and characters from his fantasies and memories descend a large staircase. He sees his wife and promises her his love, and all the characters dance in a circle beneath the set. There's a reason why Eight and a Half is so referenced in film. It's because the story of losing creativity is so resounding with artists. Even if you have never heard of Eight and a Half, you've seen its fingerprints all over cinema. From lost and despondent protagonists, to archetypes of hope and desperation, to simple homage, to inspired opening scenes, to utter ripoffs. The movie is overtly autobiographical. Even minute details are drawn from Fellini's personal experiences. Eight and a Half's title in itself is a meta-commentary on his previous work, as he had directed six feature-length films and two shorts, thus making this his Eight and a Half film. Fellini said that while struggling with the film's plot, he heard a small voice of creativity within. I knew. The story I would tell was of a writer who doesn't know what he wants to write. What makes this specific film so prolific is the way Fellini used his own insecurities about creating as fodder to craft something honest and vulnerable. He may not have been the first to capture the anxiety of stalled creativity, 
but he did so with so much style and distinction that the resulting film echoes thematically to this day. We can relate to Guido as a flawed protagonist because he feels as flesh and bone as you or me. When genuine emotion, especially our darker aspects, are put on display, we can explore our own failings through experiencing someone else's hardships. That's why we understand Guido more than we understand something like this. You know me. Fellini found a way to explore what Carl Jung described as his shadow self by contrasting vignettes of his real-life struggles with absurd imagined scenarios. For example, in his father's grave scene, Fellini completely captures the way you deal with the loss of parental figures in dreams, and the feeling of failing to live up to our parents' expectations. The scene ends with a kiss from his mother that lasts a beat too long, and as he pulls back, she's transformed into his wife. Before he can catch his breath, he's left alone in the graveyard. The Oedipal overtones of this sequence allude to a confused mental state that takes the viewer into his neurosis. Thus, we're transported further and further into the blurred lines between reality and fantasy, culminating in that ambiguous conclusion of the film. By this point, the narrative has shifted between life and dreams to the point we can't be sure whether Guido is dead or alive, whether it's an ending or a new beginning, how much the on-screen interactions are actually happening. The reconciliation with his wife may be real or it could just be in his mind, but certainly the fantastical circus of loved ones is imagined, even down to Guido directing a youthful version of himself with a flute. Thematically, we could consider this intentional. As Fellini once said, dreams are the only reality. Is the unconscious ever really used up? Do dreams ever end? In the end, Fellini showed us that sometimes the instrument of our destruction can be used to create. It's a simple idea, but one that lasts because of its truth. The illumination of Fellini's masterpiece is in that simple fact. Even at our lowest, when we feel the emptiest and most disillusioned, there's a wealth in those depths if we're willing to lay our cards on the table and allow ourselves to be exposed. Art is striving for an understood truth, and if we're able to step back from the static of our minds and see the whole manic picture, we may be able to find the ingenuity within us to transform that hellscape into meaning and share it with others. Our fears, fantasies, memories, chaos, hangups, and dreams are opportunities for inspiration. So next time you're ravaged with emptiness and feel no axiom to cling to, just ask yourself, do dreams ever end? Mm -hmm.